Hello and welcome to Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. Here we have intimate conversations with extraordinary dance and theater artists about reimagining creativity and supporting and building community. Creative Vitality Jam Sessions and I walk in solidarity and as allies for equality, justice, and respect. Because Black Lives Matter. And we will keep in motion until change comes. I'm Helen Pickett, and today's remarkable guest is Susan Jaffe, new director of Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Susan and I have known each other since 2015, but she has been a force of nature and inspiration in my life since I was 15. Welcome, Susan Jaffe. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. I am just uh, so thrilled whenever I talk about you with other people or now just to say the director of Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, it is just the best. <laughs> it is Thank just you. the best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I actually, I've kind of outed you. You, I assume you're in Pittsburgh. I always ask what part of the world people are in. <laughs> I am in Pittsburgh and I've been here for just about two months. Actually. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. New home, new everything. Yes. Amazing. Oh, new people, new job, but I'm having a great time. Yeah. I, I can't wait to visit you and, and see your remarkable company. I really can. And um, we will be having you choreograph in my beautiful company. So I, I'm well, excited. I can't wait for that too. But first of all, I just want to come stay with you in your home and hang out and have, uh, you know, chats about art and go on walks and all the stuff we did in North Carolina. And I just wanted to say to our audience that um, I, I have a big girl crush on Helen Pickett. She is one of the most amazing choreographers and inspiring speakers. And I've just been so grateful to know her. So you just need to know. She's one of my favorite choreographers. Not even just favorite, female choreographers. Favorite choreographers of all time. So. Uh, everybody needs to know that. There's a lot of mutual love here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Hey, I want to start from the present. You are the new director of Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Um, it is an unorthodox start with coronavirus. Um, but if, any bird, if anybody or any person can start a leadership position during this time, it's you. Can you share your thoughts about starting a directorship in this time, besides the obvious challenges, and then perhaps with the obvious challenges? Yes. Well, you know, I was actually initially sort of reluctant to take the position because, um, you know, I was in a very sort of secure job in the university and here we are in the middle of COVID-19 and I was going to take the helm as the artistic director in a performing arts organization and what um, institutions were really hurting from the pandemic was the arts. And so it was uh, a really hard decision or it, it took me a while to sort of choose um, to actually take the job. But for me, it felt, and I've always followed my, my intuition, my heart, it, it felt like a calling. And so I thought, okay, this is dangerous to do this, but I can't not do it. And so that's why um, I took the job. And so the challenges are that, um, in fact, we do have dancers in studios right now, but the challenge was initially creating an environment where dancers and all staff and students could come into the buildings and be safe. And so we work with engineers, we work with medical doctors, we, put down incredibly stringent 
COVID-19 protocols about how to be in the building, how to sanitize and all of those things. And um, it took a while to get the dancers to feel comfortable enough to come in. And we've been there for three weeks now rehearsing. So it's been harder because we have to have these 45 minute cleanings in between each rehearsal. And that's not just cleaning the floor and cleaning the bars or, or the equipment, but cleaning the air. Oh. So, you know, trying to create a schedule like that uh, was super tough, but that was, that is in the past. It's all sort of, um, we have a great template. Dancers are dancing and we are performing on September 10th in an outdoor theater. Oh my God. Yeah. And actually we put the outdoor theater in our parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, at this point during COVID-19, you know, people are starving for the arts and, and artists are starving to give. And so um, I just think it's just kind of gritty to be out there in the parking lot and also Allegheny, Allegheny, Allegheny County, um, up until yesterday only was allowing 50 people per event for anything outside. And that includes performers, stagehands, ushers, any kind of staff. And so that is another reason why we did it in the parking lot so that we could put all the performers in the building and then they're not part of the event. So, so anyway, but we just found out yesterday that it, that was increased to a hundred however, 100 people per event. However, we are doing 12 foot pods. So, and everything is social distance in the audience. So um, we're gonna remain to keep audience members safe and remain to keep our dancers safe. But um, we're super excited uh, to do the performances and um, they're short performances. So it's all COVID tailored for COVID-19. 45 minute performances, you go in, you go out, you don't worry about having to use restrooms or things like that through an intermission, et cetera. So, and we're gonna do two shows a day. So it'll actually end up being 10 performances. So, you know, when I hear you talk about this, my mind immediately went, especially when I heard that, you know, you have created a stage in the parking lot, my mind immediately went to you know, the old ballet theater days, which, you know, the company that you were with, but I mean way before you, in the old city ballet days, mm. where they would just perform because they needed to and they would find a venue. And, and I have to say, hearing you and the, the uh, ingenuity, you know, this is also the birth of a new time. I mean, it's exciting. You're getting you get to do 10 shows. I know. And a coveted thousand people get to be a part of this. I know. I mean, it's it's really, it is the dawn of a new era in a way. And look what you're doing, you know? And it's like, you know the, the wonderful thing of less is more? Uh-huh. <laughs> you're totally doing this. You're totally saying, you're, you're wetting the appetite. Yes. And you know, and it, it's it's literally the only thing that we can do. <laughs> and so, you know, you're doing it. Yeah, but we also, I mean, we have several other things that one that we've already done, which was, um, which I actually created when I was still living in Winston and still being the dean and onboarding here in Pittsburgh. I created, uh, we, we found out that our performances in Hartwood Acres, this beautiful uh, park in Pittsburgh, and they have an outdoor theater, and we found out that they were going to be closed for the summer, so we were not able to perform in Hartwood Acres, and so we were approached by KDKA News, and they said, um, or KDKA channel. And they said, how would you like to perform in Hartwood Acres on the grounds and we'll film you and we'll put it on television. 
And so I said, oh my gosh, what an opportunity. And I thought, oh, it's a summer performance. And why don't I just do a Midsummer Night's Dream? And so what I did was um, I took, you know, and we had two weeks to get it ready, two weeks. And so what I did was I took the overture and you know, in, in every overture of Mendelssohn, the Midsummer Night's Dream Mendelssohn, and I took the overture and I, as you know, in, in every overture, it, it, it introduces what is going to be happening throughout the rest of the piece of music. And therefore it had Oberon, Titania, Puck, Bottom, you know, the actors, um, Hermina, Helena, D Demetrius, Lysander, it had all of those characters. And so what I did was I storyboarded it. And this is when Hermina walks in and this is what's happening here. And this is what that scene looks like. And then I chose four choreographers within the company because they've been doing a lot of social media choreography. And so I divvied out the characters to each of the choreography choreographers and they created a 13 minute Midsummer Night's Dream on these beautiful grounds of Heartwood Acres. And it was performed last Sunday night and it was beautiful. And the choreographers did so well. And you know, that's just, it's just the times, you know, and all this time has really created a lot of inventiveness um, just out of sheer, you know, desire to do something. Exactly. So. And yeah. to be a part of the community. For those of us like myself, it's, you know, a freelance choreographer, uh, you know, it's just an endeavor to be a part of the community, a community that I've loved and, and that has given me so much over the years. You know, it's, it's um, yeah, it is, it's unprecedented times and that, that's said a lot, I know, but it's true. Um, let's see here. Um, well, I think you've spoken to this a bit, but um, what plans, quote unquote, dreams do you have for Pittsburgh Ballet Theater? Well, I guess looking forward. Yeah, looking forward. Um, well, one of the things projects we're doing right now is we are creating an outdoor Dracula, a short version of outdoor Dracula to go on Halloween. And so, um, yeah, we're actually thinking about, there's this beautiful street that has, shows homes uh, and porches and things, and maybe going there and doing little um, parts of the story, 10 minutes on this porch, 10 minutes on that porch, and go down the street, and then you get the whole story of Dracula. And I'm really in love now with these very short performances. So um, I'll storyboard that. I, I won't have time to choreograph it, so I will choose uh, some choreographers within the company. Um, but um, so we're gonna do that. And I thought, you know, that'd be a, just a fantastic tradition for the future, right? So you just doing inventive things. Uh, we are doing a virtual Nutcracker as well. Um, and that's got, it's very different than, than sort of your normal, let's film a performance and put it on TV. Um, but for the further out into the future is that, you know, I love the classics, of course, and this town loves the classics, of course, and the story ballets, of course. Um, but I would also love to bring new innovative choreography and more diverse, from more diverse choreographers, more female choreographers, more African American or other diverse groups of choreography so that um, we just get a much more diverse experience as an audience. Um, and, you know, I really want to bring choreography that really challenges the dancers because as you know as a choreographer the more you challenge a dancer the better they get and so um i, I think that i am really excited i mean the company is well positioned to do that and so uh yeah that's where i want to go with this company well um it sounds very um it sounds really exciting. Also, you know, from your rich history from the classics, and I've seen you coach, you're just, uh, first of all, you like to coach, but also I've seen you 
I always say it's like pulling, like Billy used to do this. I always felt like he kind of went like this and kind of pulled out the, the stuff that was supposed to emerge from my heart. And I've seen you do the same thing with dancers. And um, so, uh, and plus you've, you've, you've been inside all of the great classical roles. You know, you've lived these things of the senses and, and the emotion and, the, and everything. And um, I, I'm just frankly very excited, you know, to see a lot of these, because um, it will be new iterations because you're gonna be able to coach. You know, I feel like even, even bringing existing classics back, there always can room for a new iteration within. Oh, totally. Existing situation. Totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. new interpretations new new ways of doing things i mean as you know uh even over the course of our careers you know technique has gotten so much better over you know when i look at what dancers can do today you know i, I would never been able to do triple fuetes you know and all that stuff and i mean i see um women on instagram doing six and seven and eight pirouettes just like this is normal you know and so, um, and also choreographers who are really expanding the body, you know, really bringing the body to its absolute ends of what it can absolutely do, off balance, totally extended uh, with different rhythms, different pathways, you know. This is developing uh, such a honed instrument. And, um, and at something that you had said a little bit earlier about, you know, I had lived through these ballets. These ballets and the information is in my DNA. No. It's in every cell of my body. And it's impossible to, to extricate it from myself. I, it's there, right? So, and that's also why I love to coach because um, I know what it feels like. And so it's much easier to help a dancer when you actually know what it feels like um, and also what it's supposed to look like or what the energy is through a step and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the dance world just continues to grow and grow um, and the innovation is amazing, especially the between, um, from my point of view, standing as an artistic director of a ballet company uh, is the marriage of classic ballet and contemporary. Um, and that is where it becomes so juicy and so innovative. And um, we're just gonna keep, keep exploring. I mean, the dance world will continue to be innovative and creative. Um, so it's a very exciting world to live in still. I think so. And I think great strife has brought upon has brought great art. If you look through the history of our world, you know, it's always in times of uh, upheaval that art also has really important things to say and, and paradigm shift in the art world. And um, I, I feel very hopeful. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, for the dancers tuning into our program when this airs uh, tomorrow on Sunday, your dance career is the penultimate example of reimagining. You were a principal dancer for 22 years, 22 years with American Ballet Theater, danced internationally with umpteen European companies, hailed as the quintessential, I'm going to quote this because somebody wrote this about you, the New York Times, I believe the quintessential American ballerina. What kept you curious? Where and how did you find the unending inspiration? And how would you define courage and commitment through this curiosity and redefining? That's a loaded question. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, you know, I think dance, dance and to really speak through dance is so hard. It is 
so hard. And I think if you're not a curious person as a dancer, your instrument and your interpretations will be sort of run of the mill and uh, not inspiring and not life affirming and not uh, a place where people discover themselves uh, while watching you. You know, one of the things I had said to myself when I was younger, or it was an aspiration. It was a lofty goal that I, I don't think I ever achieved, but I, I, what I wanted was, and perhaps I did at moments, um, I wanted my soul to move other souls, to show them the deepest parts of themselves, to show the deepest part of our own humanity, whether it be through the Swan Queen or Lizzie Borden or any of the roles or anything even um, without story, without narrative. To, to discover who we are on such a deep level. And I wanted to be that. I wanted to be that conduit. And if you want to be something that lofty, um, you can never stop because you, you have to keep discovering as, as humanity keeps discovering. And so um, that was why, what kept me curious, what kept me going and still does today. Um, and it, it's not necessarily about me being that instrument. Now it's about honing that instrument in others, which is, was actually a gift that I discovered after I retired that I had no idea how much I loved to empower other people. Um, that became a real satisfaction and deep joy. So that was the first part of your question. And, um, the second part of your question, I can't remember now. Well, um, how would you define courage and commitment through this uh, reimagining, you know, through your life? And, and I just spoke, because other questions are coming, I just spoke about your dance career. But, you know, it's kind of a bigger, I guess it's kind of a bigger question, um, you know, about the courage and commitment it takes to, because... I do want to preface one thing, you know, when you were speaking, the energy that comes through your words, the energy that is behind your lofty goals, and I don't think they were lofty, that is, an, that is a life energy that can sustain a person. That's what I call need. So I guess it's like, and along with that need, I think courage and commitment. So I guess that's, that's the second. How, how could you define that? I think, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to try to do it in, in two different interpretations. One was, it was specifically for me, which is that you could either look at, look at a goal or look at something you want to do and shy away from it and say, oh, I'm not good enough to do that. Or you can look at something and love it and desire it and passionate and be so passionate about it that you have no choice but to be courageous, but to walk through those fires. And it's not even, um, you have to walk through those fires if you want to to do what you feel your calling is, right? And so in a way, it doesn't even end up being courageous because if you look at the other side, which is I'm going to walk away because I'm not good enough. Well, first of all, everybody by the fact that they are human being has tremendous potential, right? Tremendous. And it really is a matter of, do you think you can do it? right? And people who have done amazing things, well, there was a time before they did those amazing things. And they thought they could do it. And they did. Right? And there, I love this famous quote by Henry Ford. He says, whether you think you can, 
or you can't, you're right. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> right? Yes. So I figure, you know, you've got this one life to live, and I would much rather try and fail than not try at all. Right? Yeah. 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 I know you are like, you are that way too. So, <clears throat> What is commitment? What is passion? Bridge is is desire desire to know and love and be and grow and learn and expand, and that's what it is, you know. And you know, sometimes I look at young people because I was a dean of students for eight years at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, and you could see. Who had that burning desire, right? And you knew, I, there was this one student, whenever I got close to her to give her a correction, it's like she started hyperventilating. She just wanted to eat every word I said. She just wanted, she wanted it so badly. And you I know, know what between, you're talking about. Yeah, between, the moment she was in, arrived at school, you know, she couldn't stretch her knees, or she wasn't pointing her feet all that well, her arms needed a lot of work. And by the time she left the school, and even up until now, because she's a soloist in a company right now, which wasn't that long between graduation, um, she made herself because she had so much love and passion, you know? And so that, um, trying to inspire that in somebody is, is um, you know, hard to do. We can inspire, but then that person has to say, do I want to walk away from what I can possibly do, you know, and call it defeatist and blame it on my mother, <laughs> right? Or do I just, or blame it on whoever it is, right? Oh, it's not my fault. It's everybody else's fault. Why I'm not successful, right? Or do I just want to keep walking and, and grow and learn and expand and fail along the way? And we all fail. We um, must. We must. And we fail up. You fail up, right? You fail up. And so um, I'm a bunch of failures, you know, up until, yeah, up until here and successes, right? So, you know, we're, um, I had a good friend of mine uh, that, is kind of a perfectionist. And one day I looked at him and I said, and I could see, you know, the, the perfection was sort of making him miserable. And I said, you know, I used to be a perfectionist, but now I am, I am a reformed perfectionist. <laughs> and I embody all of it. Because really, not only do you become much happier, but also you stop beating yourself up from, for things that you're just imagining anyway. So, you know, we need to fail up. We need to be um, in, uh, embrace failure as part of our growth. Um, so that's grit. That's courage. Yeah. Uh, yeah sure. You know, it's funny. I also, I'm like you, uh, I don't know how many years ago now, but I started saying to, to also to students and to dancers, I said, you know, I don't believe in perfection anymore because it's a trap. Oh, it's totally a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap to make you fail down. Yep. And so, and I like seeing, you know, the sparks behind their eyes because usually it's like, well, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Perfection. I was like, no, perfection, you know, I, you know, attain, stay in the journey. Right. Stay in the journey. Yeah. Because that perfection trap, it's going to try to get you, you know, it's like, just, just don't believe in it. Don't give it power. Exactly. You know, and I know that it's, it's semantics and it's different iterations and people don't mean perfection when they say it, but like you, I'm a big believer in the words that we say and the words we put out because the connotation of perfection is what it is. You can slap something else onto it, but look in the dictionary. You know, <laughs> <it's>, you, know? <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, your love and commitment, truly, 
to ballet kept developing as you continued your dance life. I have felt personally your need that carries you to your core when it comes to ballet, and it is, it is truly inspiring. From 2002 to 2012, you were affiliated in multiple ways with American Ballet Theater, co-founded and co-directed the Princeton Dance and Theater Studio in Princeton, New Jersey. You expanded yourself, using your words, into choreography. You were the Dean of Dance at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts from 2012 to 2020. Susan, by this time, you knew and experienced every aspect inside and out about and through and with ballet. Can you explain how these components contributed to your current beliefs about ballet? Again, we've kind of gone there now, but I'm sure there is more. And, um, oh, that is that question. Can you explain how these components contributed to your current beliefs about ballet? Wow. Uh. Ah, uh, you know, it's, it's so interesting because, um, I, as you said, I've seen all aspects. Um, and for a dancer, being in the studio and being on stage is um, an all-consuming uh, job for a dancer. But as you sort of step out of personally performing, Mm. Um, then you start to see the, the nuts and bolts uh, behind the, how you get on stage, how a dancer gets, how it all happens. And um, it's really, I've learned so much about being organized, about planning, about making sure that you don't drop the important balls and, and also to know which balls to drop. But um, um, for me, it, it, it has now become another aspect of my love and my, my, my gift that I want to give back to the dance world. And why I say that is because, you know, I feel it's very important for me to be responsible, to be organized, to be ready, to plan, to do all the aspects of the behind the scenes so that those performances can happen and be beautiful. Um, and, you know, somebody could say, well, why would you want to do all that, you know, administrative work and everything? Because as a dean, I did a lot of administration. Um, to me, it was about supporting people, right? All of that has to happen in order for other people to shine. Uh, so to, to help my faculty shine, to help my students shine. Um, and what I used to say to my students who were afraid of me, I would say, what you need to understand is my job as a dean is not dean as the uh, authority my job as a dean is to be of service to you. And so my job now as an artistic director is to be of service to our dancers, to our organization, to our community, and to the art. Because ballet was, to be a ballerina, was the greatest dream fulfillment I could have ever hoped to have. I mean, when I think about how lucky I was to have, I'm not saying that I didn't work for it. I did, I worked very hard. But because I had such a, it was such a gift to have that career, that the way that I bring meaning to my life is to be of service to the dance world. And um, that brings me so much satisfaction. And yeah, there is a lot of hard work behind it. Yes, administration can be tedious and all of that, but what it does is it organizes and supports the institution so that everything can shine and grow. And um, that's just been incredibly satisfying amazingly satisfying. Beautiful. 
Um, your choreography is a large part of your creative life. Um, can you take us through what a process is for you as a choreographer? Or you can choose, I know it's different for every piece, but for example, is music first, is story first, is, uh, you know, inspiration from outside, a painting, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I've always wanted to go to see, uh, go into a museum and say, oh, that, that painting inspired me to make a dance, but it just did never happen. <laughs> um, mostly, it's the music. The music calls to me, and I feel connected to it. And then once I start listening to it, I start to see steps. Mm -hmm and uh and structure and all of that and that's way before i even get into the studio um i have only to this date done one story ballet which was the nutcracker for my school in princeton and so um but you know also for uh, right now because i'm storyboarding dracula you know i'm reading the book i'm studying the cliff notes i'm studying all the characters and what makes them rich and full because i did all that as a dancer i worked with a dramaturg for all of my roles my characters um so i have a feeling um since dracula will be my second story ballet in all these years um that as I work with choreography, choreographers, uh, that some of the characters will actually um, uh, develop the volume and amplitude of certain movements or of certain scenes and things like that. So, but of course, for me, so much is driven by the music. Um, and um, yeah, so mostly the music. And then I start to write down, you know, and structure through that, through that music. I don't know how to read music. And I just want to say to anybody who's a young dancer out there, learn how to read music because it will be so much easier um, than doing what I do, uh, which is I literally create my own scores because I love those I love John Cage and I love all those sort of asymmetrical kinds of um, music. Um, and so if you don't know how to read music, you have to create your own score because if you just kind of meander through the music and just decide, you know, let it just, the, the movement fall wherever it decides to, you're not really gonna have an articulate dance. And so um, I have to tell this funny story. So I. I was invited to a company to, to choreograph. And I chose the music. I said, please get the right rights to it. Oh yeah, 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 it's all fine, it's all fine. I get there, I choreograph for the first day. And then the executive director comes up to me and says, I just found out we don't have the rights to your music. And I had, two weeks to court or three, maybe three weeks to choreograph. And I only had something like three hours a day. So I went home that night and I just started combing through all of my music. Cause I'd like to save pieces of music that I really like. And of course I love contemporary music. Um, when I choreograph contemporary ballet. And so I found this piece of music and I had to score it. And so, you know, up until 3 a.m., waking up at six, scoring it, going in, rehearsing, scoring the next section, going in, rehearsing. And the director of the company um, was a male. And he uh, would come into my studio and he would say, why bother counting? Yeah. And looking at me like, oh, you poor thing. You're like overworking. You're just you're just trying way too hard. And it was kind of patronizing. Um, he was a friend of mine. So. Huh? Kind of. <laughs> he was a friend of mine, but um, I was just like, you know, this is the typical, um, anyway, you know what I mean. So anyway, the performance came 
and the review came. And the review said that those dancers never looked more articulate, uh, had more energy, more definition, more uh, conviction than ever before. And I, and I thought, and this, this person, choreographer, director, uh, was very uh, uh, generous and kind afterwards. And, and I think it actually might have taught him a lesson as well about being prepared when you walk into a studio. Yeah. And the music is actually important. <laughs> um, and to, to define the movement through the music. Uh, otherwise, it's just like, la, 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 and everybody's kind of wiggling and shaking and not doing anything that has real meaning and definition. Um, so anyway. You know, you, you, you know I'm, I'm similar in how I score because I also don't read music, right? But um, uh, I, so I, 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 I've never used the word score, but I do similar work that you're talking about. And one of those situations happened to me too, but I had four days notice. But, you know, I mean, the night, the days, I mean, that's, that's remarkably stressful. And uh, yeah, you know, the review also just, it was talking about musicality, but the work that you put in and the scoring that like, cause you said it, it actually carries forward in all the aspects of the dance. That definition and that preparation and that attention to detail, which is one reason why I really love ballet technique. I mean, how many tondus have we done in our life? And, you know, after three knee operations, I, I can hardly do anything. But I tell you, I'll put on music. I can still do a tondu and a degage. And, you know, I still love shaping that idea. Oh, yeah. It? It's, it's like, I don't know what it is, but I... I don't, I don't even know where it comes from, but just to shape my foot, just to, just to go through that and feel the floor and, and feel, the, you know, it's, um, so I'm with you about that, how you define your music and you score your music and what, then the review, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's redemption, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, it was fun. Yeah. Um, you and I have had conversations about tenacity and courage and intention and desire when it comes to what it takes to be a dancer or even in the dance field, uh, not just a dancer. Um, well, I'm going to ask it, but I mean, you've just been a fountain of inspiration in this. Do you have words of wisdom about becoming an artist? Um, yeah, and, and this, you know, what comes to mind is um, it was in Martha Graham's book. And one point, Agnes DeMille was lamenting about something that she had created and that she just did not think was good enough. And Martha turned to her and she said, it is not up to you to decide whether something is good or is not good. It is only up to you or incumbent upon you to keep the juices open, to keep yourself open to the inspiration, to be that conduit of creativity so that you are ready when it comes. And if we close ourselves down by judgments, uh, by saying lies to ourselves, like I'm not good enough, just like Henry Ford. I mean, Henry Ford, did he even get a high school degree? I mean, whether you think you can or can't, you're right. So if you close yourself off by judging and by saying things like I can't do this and things like that, you literally not only take that away from you, but you take away your potential that you could be giving to the world. And so um, I would say that to an artist that be mindful of when you're telling yourself lies, which is 
I'm not good enough, I can't do this, and all of those things. Everybody else is more talented than I, because everybody has talent, everybody has creativity, but it is up to you to keep that channel open. Mm -hmm. And you cannot keep that channel open by blocking it with judgment and criticism and all those things. So stay open, be alive with the creation, be alive with creativity, be joyful because you will attract what you put out. Um, and I have story after story, I have this workshop called The Effect of Intention. Story after story of ballerinas that I was colleagues with during my career, uh, people who were so confident, even at a young age, even before they became a huge star, and they literally, the energy of their intention happened first and then their career followed. So um, it is so important to uh, stay positive, rem recognize when you're not uh, in your truth, which is when you are condemning and judging and criticizing yourself and others, by the way. Um, and then just in, as you said, to quote my friend, Helen Pickett, enjoy the journey. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so I think that kind of is, um, a bit of, you know, of these last three questions that I ask everybody for the daily insight or inspiration, but I do, <clears throat> I've kind of, I'm going to go back to this uh, other question, but I would like you to, if you don't mind, speak about your, the workshop you mentioned, but actually you have an app from, for meditation. Can you talk about that? Do you want to talk about that? I, I actually don't have an app. Quote okay. unquote. Yeah, I do sell the meditations on my website. There you go. So if you, you can buy it through Amazon, you can buy, there are five different um, meditations there and they're more introductory. They're at the most 17 minutes long is one of them. That's the longest one. Um, so they're introductory because the, the, the course uh, introduces meditation as a way to know yourself deeply. And so these are meditations to help you do that. Um, and to get to some some deep deeper parts of yourself. So yes, yeah, so that you can just literally uh, buy off the website. Um, but I would recommend actually doing the workshop because then those meditations make a heck of a lot more sense. Um, and as you know, and you know this very well because you are uh, a never ending seeker and curious person, um, is that if, is that every great artist is great because of their authenticity, their authentic self. And you cannot be authentic if you are not looking within, if you are not seeking within, and that if you're always looking externally, you will never find that beauty, that depth. So it is very important for artists to know who they are on a deep level, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, because that is the tools and the juice of your creative voice. And so that is what this workshop is about, is to get you into that uh, space and also to find, uh, to, to find when you you are lying to yourself, to find those those places where you block your creativity. So uh, that's what that is about. And then those uh, meditations go in alignment with that workshop. Beautiful, yeah. Um, and I am jumping ahead again, but just uh, your website is simply your name. Yep, SusanJaffe.com. Yeah. Okay, that's easy to find. www.susanjaffe.com. <laughs> Easy to World find. Podcast. Easy to find. Um, uh, now, you're going to have a bajillion of these, and I know many people, but do you have, 
something that comes up right now, your favorite or impactful memory from your creative life? Uh, this was one of my favorite memories. Um, I was, in fact, doing working with a lot of tools that I put in my workshop. Um, I was in my 30s, and um, I was walking in the principal hallway at the Metropolitan Opera House. And Martine Van Hamel, who was a principal before I, and she's a little bit older, so she retired earlier, she walked by me in the hallway and she said, have fun, because I was supposed to dance the Swan Queen that, that night. And I said, thank you, I will. And she stopped and she turned around and she said, you think you're gonna have fun tonight? <laughs> you know, because we all know how hard, it's so hard, you know, Swan Lake is so hard. And so I said, yeah, I, I really am. And I was so excited to go on stage. And that performance is, is what I call riding the wave or what other people have called the flow. Yeah. Um, I was literally danced. I was danced. And it was so much fun. Like the performance danced through me. The interpretations, the steps, the, the characters danced through me. It was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fun and um you know that was something that also the meditation to be that conduit is why it sort of kept me in that practice was that i so that i could be that instrument to be danced you know of course you have to do all the work you don't if you haven't done the background work nothing else can happen. Forget about it. Exactly. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was a super, super fun performance. I had a similar experience with Artifact, full-length Artifact, um, a ballet from Bill, four acts. And um, I actually asked to be in the third act. Usually if you did one of the pot of this, you didn't do the improvisational act, the third part. And I asked Bill if I could do it because I wanted to experience going through the whole thing. And I also did that in Czar when I was dancing, when I had the speaking role, I asked to do in the middle. So I'd have this feeling of, of being danced. Yeah. You yeah. know, and yeah, I know exactly. Well, I don't know exactly what you mean because we're all yeah. individual, but I can sense, I have an idea. Yeah. 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 Last big question, in supporting and building a more equitable dance community, and again, the caveat is there are many, many things that need to happen. What do you believe needs to be shifted or changed? Mm. Well, that is a big discussion um, at Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Um, we, have, we have these uh, several different uh, groups called the Equity and Diversity Team or the Equity Transformation Team. Um, we have, uh, what do you call them, book clubs, for example. And right now we're really focusing on um, diversity in the African-American culture and how those things in the world not only are shifting, but need to shift much, much more. Um, and then also bringing more uh, females, female choreographers and females into organizations or ballet companies. And so those things really do need to shift. Um, we do need to bring a more equi equitable organization forward. And I have to say, it was just a few days ago I sat with, uh, we, we have one female uh, African-American woman in the company. We have one African-American male in the company. And I, I sat the female down and I said, I want to give you the opportunity um, to wear the color of tights that match your skin, should you, should you choose to do that. And um, if that is something that you want to do, and I just want you to know, I am behind you. And just to see her spirit, it was, it was amazing. 
to see this sort of weight lifted off her and this this joy of of being seen and accepted and loved and and you know um, because there are people who say, well, you know, classical ba ballet, you have to have pink tights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't, actually. Um, and, you know, I also said to this dancer, you know, you can choose. In this ballet, you want to wear pink tights, you go ahead. You don't have to be married to one decision or the next. It, it's, you, I want you to be a uh, flow with how you feel. And so um, I know that a lot of directors are talking about that as well, um, about uh, the color of tights in classical ballets, et cetera. So there's just much more um, that needs to be done. There's a big conversation right now uh, with dance historians and other formidable people in the dance world on an email about black face and ballet, yellow face and ballet, uh, there's a lot of discussion now. And also, how do you bring and celebrate cultures in ballet, like La Bayadere, for example, without culturally appropriating? Um, so there's so much discussion right now um, in the dance world about this. And, and it's a very exciting time. And it's also sort of, a letting go of things that we've known and things that are tried and true. Um, and so it can be scary, but it's also kind of wonderful. Yeah, so, and, and can you imagine how scary it's been for the people that have been uh, overlooked and misrepresented, how, how much fear they have had for how many years? So, you know, when I, it's like, you know, uh, it is, it is only the limitation of ourselves that let us not be inclusive and let us not be allies. Because I keep asking myself over all of these years, since 2000, since I moved back to the States, why not? Yeah. The, the, the face of America in the ballet company is a must at this point because it will make us better. Yeah. I've, I have seen it time and time again, inclusion of, of, of Black Lives Matter, of everyone at the table makes us better. Totally. There, is, it is, there is proof. Yeah. Because it is a mixture of, of cultures and, 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 and diverse thinking. And yes, we are all different. And, and it is, that is the beautiful part of humanity. The difference is the beauty. Totally. totally. You know, it's like, we're ready. You know, yeah. let's go. Yeah. You know? And it is a shame that, you know, we had to experience uh, George Floyd, you know, and just all the stuff that's going. Oh, but that's been happening forever. It's been happening forever. <laughs> but I think everybody is standing up and opening up their windows and saying, I'm tired, you know, and I'm not going to take this anymore. That's what I mean. Like, like it's 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 to the point where you know it's like there are many things that I wrangle against against the phone, but you know those phones have allowed proof, like proof that was never never came to light. Yeah. Never came to light. Yeah. So uh, I, I think yeah. Uh, again, you know. Yep. Yep. Positive. Positive. Yeah, positive. Yeah. And also celebrating, allowing more female choreographers yeah. to, to do full length ballets and to do, you know, I know you're do, you've done a couple, some amazing award winning uh, ballets. Uh, so we need more of that. We want more of that. Um, I just remember just quickly when I first started, chore I had just retired and uh, I had opened my dance school and I had come to a gala where I met many of the patrons of ABT that I have known for many, many years. And many of them said, so what are you doing now? Oh, oh well, you know, I, I own a dance school. Oh, that's so nice, you know, and I choreograph. 
Oh. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, you know what? If I were a male, mm. if I were Marcelo Cor uh, Gomez at, you know, at that time and said, who was in the company at that time and said, I want, I am starting to choreograph. They would be like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, you know, I can't wait to see your work. No, but because I was female, um, there was just this confusion and, and like, I don't understand. You've been a, you were like a swan queen all your life and now you want to choreograph, you know? And so it was really revealing. Uh, so, um, the world is coming a long way out of that. We still have a ways to go. Yeah. So. Um, wow. I knew this talk would be um, extraordinarily inspiring. Um, and I do have to just tell one more story um, about when I was a kid, started when I was 15 and um, you know, our home theater was the War Memorial Opera House in um, San Francisco. And you know, as you do, you get to know the backstage guy at the, at the door, you know, and they let you sneak in when you're a kid, go ahead, just don't make any trouble. And uh, at 15, I started doing that, you know, because I just, uh, when American Ballet Theater came to town and I'd stand right against, you know, remember those theaters that had the ropes, you know, the whole wall of ropes? Yep. I'd stand right there, I'd stand stuck there, or I'd sneak out and do standing room, you know, there. And I remember watching you. <laughs> I remember watching you when you came on tour. And, um, and then fast forward when I auditioned for ballet theater, I remember watching you walk into the studio and I thought, if nothing else happens in my career. <laughs> and then fast forward to when you came to Atlanta to watch The Exiled and Jared, our mutual friend, walked you down the stairs in the, it was, a, uh, it was an intermission and uh, walked you down the stairs and I turned around and I was like, <gasps> and I, I, I started up the stairs and I tripped. <laughs> Yes, and I fell into you. And I grabbed your thighs, and like it's like I was kneeling at you, you know, like an idol. And I was mortified, and you were so elegant about it. You helped me up. You're like, "Hello, I'm Susan." <laughs> this is the crowning glory, you know. Talent <laughs> picket, absolutely. It's not the first time that that kind of thing has happened, but but that's a that's a little journey of uh, of my history, of, and then we're friends. So that that's the great part. Yes. But um, so you 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 know you've I want people to know more about you. So you have your website, uh, susanjaffe.com. Um, do you have any social media tags? Also, of course, Pittsburgh Ballet Theater to find about about the company you're directing now. Yes, well, uh, I have a uh, Susan Jaffe series, hashtag Susan Jaffe series uh, for Instagram. And so I sort of use that platform when I do a blog or, you know, uh, post anything about the um, effective intention. And uh, then I just hashtag, you know, Pittsburgh or I hashtag myself and other things. So um, that I, I really need to get better at social media. Um, and it's just been a little challenging since I've arrived here in Pittsburgh uh, to do anything but to work on uh, what I need to there. Yeah. So hopefully I'll have a little bit more time in the future. Well, um, if you don't mind staying with me while we finish up, um, there is a short bio of Susan on the description page that you'll find hello the interview when when you watch it when you watch this amazing woman um and we have two new sessions uh every week tuesday and sunday on the youtube channel by the same name and on our next session you will meet uh, a beautiful dancer from charlotte ballet raven barkley 
Um, now it's time for thanks. Um, thank you, Susan, for your generosity today and all of your wisdom um, and your friendship. Yes, and thank for you. allyship. Yes, and thank you for all the questions because a real artist would ask ask the kind of questions that you do. And um, you are, are also a huge inspiration of mine. So it was really fun for me to do this interview with you. Thank you so much. Um, our beautiful dance community that has given both of us so immensely, given so immensely. Uh, I thank the generosity of the dance world that has also sustained me and us and held us for so many years and thanking the people who tune in and all the wonderful souls out there, continuing art and continuing their lives. Keep reimagining creativity. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, Susan. Bye.